Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today we're kicking off the week with Nick Thomas, who's the astronaut lead uh, educator out there at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Hey, Nick. Good to see you. Well, always great to see you. Nick spends an hour with us once a month and tells some great stories that only he can tell from your remarkable perspective on this space program here, Nick. What are we going to talk about today? Well, this being the month of March, we've got three major flights to talk about. We've got Gemini 3, we've got um, uh, Gemini 8, and Apollo 9, all three of which were important in the uh, uh, progression to getting to the moon. Some very important firsts. And of course, in the, the case of Gemini 8, our first in-flight emergency. So a lot of ground to cover today, but some good history. Yeah, some great history. So get back, kick back, get your favorite beverage, and enjoy some great space stories today from our astronaut heroes. We also want to wish a happy birthday to this astronaut hero. Jim Lovell is 96 years old today. James Arthur Lovell, uh, one of the Mount Rushmore guys of the program. Yeah, That's remarkable a, man. A great way to put it. Born March 25th, 1928 in Cleveland, Ohio, yeah. one of the two dozen Ohio knots. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he had 96 years old. He's the oldest living space explorer, period. Yeah. Okay. And we hope he's having a great day. There he is. Uh, uh, feted during the Apollo 13 movie, the Hollywood blockbuster, and his Apollo outfit. People uh, in the business uh, that you know very well do like Apollo 13 as a representation. Yeah, they enjoy the movie very much. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing the premiere in Cocoa Beach with Fred Hayes, uh -huh. and I talked to Fred afterwards. I said, well, what do you think? He says, I liked it. He said, I especially liked the ending, which I, I bet you did. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, yeah, it... Uh, uh, 13 uh, strikes a chord not only with the viewing public but also with the astronauts who see it as being such a good, uh, accurate representation not only of the spaceflight process but also the cooperation, the work between the, the crew and mission control and just exactly what uh, conditions mission control sometimes has to, oper have to operate under. Absolutely. We wish Lovell a great birthday. Happy we birthday. have in our background there is... Uh, um, Rusty Schweiker. Yep, making the spacewalk during Apollo 9 and first test of that uh, A7L uh, lunar suit that would eventually be worn on the surface of the moon. Yes, the first and only test of yeah. it, too. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. uh, very interesting. Uh, Schweiker, I believe, is 90 years old, yep. maybe 89, okay. somewhere in there. And he was in our museum not too long <laughs> ago. And uh, we wanted to also uh let everybody well it's interesting here is the group one and two yeah you know yeah. you and i talk about growing oh, up yeah. as baby boomers yeah. and i had the pictures of all these astronauts on my walls yeah. and when i when you could get them but there's your mercury and gemini first group of gemini mm -hmm. astronauts all gone except for jim lovell yeah. on the far right it's sticks. remarkable as many guys will say that the mercury seven group were probably the uh uh toughest sharpest but as far as engineering skill uh group two still uh, kind of holds the record there because he has some remarkable credentials oh. uh in that group particularly yeah. with ed white and uh uh tom safford and uh, uh pete conrad john you know, all those guys were just absolutely stellar and that was uh i think was uh called by one person the best all-around group that we ever selected Certainly, certainly. Uh, you don't see Gino in there, Gene Cern. He was in group Gene three. Was group three, yeah, uh, with Rusty. Uh, with Rusty and a couple yeah. others in there. But just, you know, we all know life is what it is. It's it's uh, just temporary. But to think that of our heroes, really, Jim Lovell's the only one left that can talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and only four moonwalkers are left. So yeah. we'll talk about that on another day. We did want... Also, send our condolences to the family of George Abbey, yeah. certainly a NASA icon, uh, considered the father of modern space flight for what he did during the Apollo. And then the, the, uh, uh, he was one of the architects of getting us back on our feet from George, Apollo 1. George came on board after the Apollo 1 fire. And in fact, if you w look at some of that classic footage of Frank Borman in the hangar as they were discussing the Apollo 1 capsule, you could see George in the background. And I think George in the background kind of says it all because 
he was not, you know, uh, one to put himself forward, but he was very much um, uh, uh, shaping events uh, with, uh, with a very uh, a close hand on the tiller. Uh, I can remember talking with um, uh, John Blaha one day, and we were going through the whole uh, process, unfortunate process with um, uh, Lisa Nowak. And I asked Blaha, I said, do you think all this would have happened if George had still been there? He said, no. I said, George would have found out about that way ahead of time and probably counseled those folks that, you know, it's probably time to uh, seek options elsewhere. But George had his, ear, way to put it. He had his ear that close to the ground and nothing happened that George didn't know about in that office and throughout the program. He was also uh, deeply responsible, along with Tom Stafford, in architecting, if that's a word, our relationship with the Russians for the International Space Station. Uh, Tom, of course, came from the whole ASTP experience. And when we saw that we were going to have to broaden our international coalition to include the Russians, uh, George got in on that and was a very, uh, a very integral part of that process, along with uh, General Stafford and others. Absolutely. We'll be doing a tribute somewhere down the line to uh, Mr. George Abbey, as he was a mentor and, and close friend to our friend, Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Mm -hmm. Our condolences to Jay and all of the NASA people here on the Space Coast. Uh, I've learned in my years here, Nick, that there is a different way that NASA here in Kennedy Space Center operates and Johnson Space Center. They even have acronyms pronounced differently, well, but uh, this the, was a guy that kept the, the, the glue together. Among the great stories of George Abbey and the stories are a legion, there is the story about that's told by virtually every astronaut who ever interviewed under him, that during the interview process, there would be about four or five people on the interview panel, including George, and George just sit back with his eyes closed the whole time, and you would swear that he was sleeping. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the questioning, George would open up his eyes and ask a question that absolutely cut to the heart of the matter that was being discussed. Uh, he was like, uh, I call him the old daddy alligator, you know, down in the weeds, nice and quiet, but ready to move when the time comes. So, yeah. And you'll, you'll find uh, opinions going from one uh, uh, extreme to the other about uh, Mr. Abbey. Um, um, uh, concerning his time there at uh, at the uh, uh, office, but uh, you can't deny the fact that he had a large hand in uh, in shaping the uh, the uh, destiny of the program. That's right. He was a director of flight operations, mm -hmm. responsible for choosing the astronauts. Uh, I've I've talked to a couple astronauts that didn't make it. They well, just, they say, well, George Abbey didn't like me. One so of the, one of the guys said that you would draw up a, a proposal for a crew chief astronaut would draw up proposal for a crew and send it up to George and George would send it back and say, no, it's not right. He wouldn't tell you what was wrong about it. He'd just say, no, that's like, and it was up to you to find out what change George wanted made. And I worked for a boss like that one time. And I, I can assure you that kind of thing can be, uh, it teaches you a lot. You learn a lot, but it can be as intimidating yeah, as hell. Absolutely. His family has said that he was a quiet man, brilliant, <laughs> humble, and very private. The world will be emptier without him. He mm -hmm. had hundreds of friends and associates all over the world. <clears throat> and one of those I said hi to today, astronaut Mike Baker, uh -huh. yeah. who uh, who worked with George very closely on the Russian relations yeah. that yeah. Bakes put together there. So yeah. and as Mr. Honeycutt had suggested, he wanted to do a, a tribute to his friend one day mm -hmm. when uh, the dust cell was there. So George was also very close to Joe Engel. Oh, was he? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah they Joe went to... They, in fact, they went to England and did a seminar on uh, developmental flight tests, and they did it along with a, uh, one of the older English test pilots, and they do a panel discussion and answer questions huh. and so forth. So. Astronaut Joe Engel, yeah. who had, at one time the only man to ride two space planes, the X-15. And shuttle. And shuttle, and now there's a handful that can say they did three three spaceships in mm -hmm. there. So. Uh, well, uh, George Abbey and your family's in our hearts as we uh, 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 go on with our, show, our Stay Curious program here today. One little brag slide to put in there. Well, there, oh, well, yeah, threw in there General Stafford. General Stafford, uh, General Stafford. We also Marvel. lost him, and I know you had a Stafford story or two you have to share. Uh, the first time I met General Stafford over at the Visitor's Complex, we were talking, and I mentioned the fact that we had his Gemini 9 capsule on display over in the hall. 
and I talked about the how you could see that center pressure on the heat shield, and he'd flown that reentry manually, and you, you saw that precise center of pressure on the heat shield, and I mentioned to him, I said, yeah, I said, I know you hold the record for the most uh, accurate splashdown of the Gemini program, and he looked at me, he smiled, he said, the most accurate of Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo, <laughs> which was true, yeah. landed closer to the carrier than any of those, in all three of those programs, and after he told me that, he went on to list uh, lift vectors, bank angles, reverse bank angles. He sat there and literally reflew that Gemini 9 reentry for me. Really? The guy, uh, Gene Cernan called him the human computer. Yeah. Uh, uh, he would also call him mumbles, not because of the way he spoke, but the fact that his brain was so fast that sometimes his mouth couldn't keep up, as, as Cernan put it. But he was Tom Stafford has had more of an effect on not only space flight but aerospace operations over the past uh, several decades than any other person I can imagine. Uh, he is also personally responsible for a lot of astronaut careers. Uh, those astronauts will never know it, but it was General Stafford's word in the process that uh, opened things up for them. And he, he had... he. Tom Stafford was mentored by Wally Schirra, who he flew with on Gemini 6. And then Stafford took upon that same role for Gene Cernan, uh, being his mentor, sponsoring him, if you will. So General Stafford, among other things, understood the importance of mentoring the human being uh, in the process. He also came over to a reunion we had of the uh, uh, TPS, the uh, Test Pilot School class, which included John McBride and Guy Gardner and, um, oh gosh, uh, Steve Nagel. Mm -hmm. So actually McBride was responsible for sneaking General Stafford on the campus. So the, the, the TPS students had no idea that General Stafford was gonna be there. And we're all gathered in front of the, the, the hall and just kind of talking. And General Stafford just kind of steps in. Nobody really notices. Somebody turns around and recognizes him. So we get in, we do the ceremony and recognize the TPS class. Uh, John asked General Stafford to get up and say a few words. Well, boy, oh boy, you're just asking a legend to get up there and tell some great stories. And General Stafford told the story at uh, Edwards Air Force Base how two of the students, and I won't mention their names, had boomed a sonic boom over Area 51. Now, the general who was in charge of the TPS program at the time, I, I can't remember his name, General Smith or something like that, was furious when he heard this. And this general said, that's it for them. No test pilot school, no NASA, no astronaut corps. And of course, that wasn't the case. But General Stafford went on to describe General Smith, and he said, I don't know how many of you people remember General Smith, but on a good day, he was spring-loaded to the pissed-off position. <laughs> That's a perfect Staffordism, if you will. But uh, Staffordism. just a, a remarkable guy, a guy who should have walked on the moon several times yeah. over. Uh, he was responsible for the development of the stealth technology that we kind of take for granted today. Called the father of the yeah, stealth. Yeah, uh, to, the, to the degree that I think some of the calculations he did were literally on the back of an envelope mm -hmm. or a cocktail napkin or something like that. But just, just uh, an incredible, gigantic presence in the space and aerospace industry. Uh, he did so much for this country that uh many people will never realize he really is he's yeah. uh he's that's a giant. No exaggeration he, what he did for the defense of our country yeah. uh you'll never know yeah. because it was such top secret stuff yeah people on dod missions and mm -hmm. so forth uh and but uh those of you that have been around him to get an yeah. autograph type of thing like you handle what a gen genteel yeah. man yes he he loved true, talking to everybody. True gentleman. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, he he was. I, I had a couple times to talk to him. I told him, I've been to your museum in Weatherford, yeah, uh, Oklahoma. He said, did they move the 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 yep. the, the, the plane uh, <laughs> there when you're there? And then he grabbed a napkin and started uh, uh -huh. putting the the telephone poles are going to be moved from here to here to here. So yep. I'm like, okay. <laughs> there was no detail too small for his attention. No, until he died at age 93 two weeks ago. He was on the safety committee with Jim Adamson, astronaut, and some others uh, on the International Space Station, talking to their Russian colleagues once a month. He was he was a chairman. 
yeah. of this uh, safety uh, committee for mm -hmm. the ISS. So he will be missed, and I can't wait to see some of the clear skies to him. and falling winds. Yeah, yeah he uh, uh, Edwards Air Force Base is the director of that after his astronaut. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder why he he at, at Apollo. 10 he would have segued into 13 or 14 as a commander very easily right well by that time you remember that alan shepherd had come back into flight uh uh, uh qual and uh we needed nasa needed someone to take over the astronaut office while shepherd was training for 14. Yeah. so general stafford took that position and then when al came back after his flight general stafford moved on to uh deke slayton's assistant Mm -hmm. So he was in a very, uh, a very good place as far as uh, the management and having an impact on the future direction of the program. And sure, everybody likes to fly forever, but at the same time, someone like General Stafford uh, probably knows quite well where his talents are needed. Yeah. And is ready to step forward, salute smartly, and press on. And those checks were a little bit bigger on behind the desks on some of well, them. Well, I will too. tell you, uh, <laughs> with someone like General Stafford, the money didn't mean a damn thing. It uh, was the, what you could contribute to the overall effort and uh, everything that you could do to make that effort better and also safer, as you say. So. Absolutely. Well, we've enjoyed talking about these giants, so we can't pass up an opportunity with Nick here to sell. To, uh, so we're going to get into our program here after we just do one more brag thing there. Marty, March 23rd, Saturday, was our fourth year, fourth anniversary of oh, doing yeah. Shuttle Fest. The COVID pandemic shut the world down in March uh, 2020, and here it is 2024, and there's you and me a couple years ago when we did it old school in the back there. So just want everyone to know we appreciate, because of you all watching this, We've entered our fourth year in over 1,010 episodes. Oh, that's incredible. And uh, it's uh, we, we have some plans to try to monetize it in a bigger way, as we should. Where else can you get Nick Thomas talking to you on a monthly basis about these great stories? This is uh, this program is not about me and Marty. It's about you and the space workers and occasionally astronauts. But, mm -hmm. you know, we enjoy the space workers and and these uh, VIPs like like Nick just as much. So Marty, thank you, buddy, for putting up with me for four years. Outstanding, guys. Well he, done. He deserves a trophy. At least a medal. You'll take a medal. Uh, okay. No, just take a new car. Yeah. Well, we we started out very humbly. Marty said he'd never get on air or ever be on the microphone and all that. Yeah, it's too bad Jim Rathman isn't with us anymore. We can see about getting you a nice car. Yeah, yeah it's a Corvette. But really, Marty, we've come a long way, and, and your contribution has, has been, uh, as a volunteer, is just incredible that he wants to show up in the middle of the day. I mean, you know, this is nap time for a lot of senior citizens. So. Are you gonna are you gonna take that, Marty? I guess I, guess I have to. Yeah. Hey, I wish I could take a nap at four o'clock some days. I'll tell you that. All right, let's turn yeah. this over to Nick Thomas here to talk about some of our beloved Gemini missions. When yeah. in 1965 and 66, uh, the world was on fire with the space race to the moon. Every six mm -hmm. weeks, we were launching two men off this planet and here we have our first two-man flight gemini 3 with gus grissom and john young brand new spacecraft new capabilities and we're on that solid engineering pathway to uh uh, uh getting the uh, eventually getting uh, uh humans on the moon here we see uh Do gus... you want to mention the unsinkable molly Brown yeah, oh, yeah people yeah, that yeah. might yeah. not know that yeah part of space history. people might know that gus grissom's mercury capsule liberty bell 7 sank to the bottom of the ocean when the hatch uh de detonated prematurely so of course there had been a lot of discussion about that and some controversy undeserved controversy and you know people talking sideways about it so gus uh decided the best way to deal with all this nonsense was to hit it head on so he made he there was a show on Broadway at the time called The Unsinkable Molly Brown and Gus saw his opening there. So he decided he was going to name his capsule because we always did in the Mercury program. He's gonna name that capsule uh Molly Brown after the unsinkable Molly Brown. <laughs> and the NASA officials weren't too terribly pleased by that because they thought it was too frivolous. And apparently someone in headquarters in DC said, you know, can't you come up with something a little more 
uh, uh, a little more prosaic, a little more serious. And he said, sure, how about Titanic? <laughs> uh, I said, okay, Molly Brown. But after that, uh, there were no more naming of uh, American spacecraft till we got to the uh, Apollo program. Around the same time, it's interesting, the crew of Gemini 4, Jim McDivitt and Ed White, uh, wanted to name their capsule American Eagle. But oh. then after the word came down after uh, Molly Brown, it was just going to be Gemini hmm. 4. Molly Brown was a survivor of the Titanic, mm -hmm. is what that play was all about. Sure, and, sure. and there's something I picked up. I didn't know that yep. four story. actually had a, a, yep. a name of American Eagle. Hmm. Yeah. Now right, here's, here's, the, guys. here's the crew there by the simulator or at the uh, mission control at uh, Cape Canaveral. This was the last flight to be controlled by mission control in Cape Canaveral. Starting with Gemini 4, uh, they moved operations over to uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. But here we see Gus and John in the final uh, uh, design of the, uh, uh, I think they are G4C uh, pressure suits for <coughs> Gemini, also wearing their parachute harnesses, but standing just outside that uh, a mobile base uh, simulator over at uh, uh, Mission Control Cape uh, Canaveral. If you have questions for Nick, please chime in there. Nick, I have one. Was this the yeah. first true space suit? The Mercury's were sort of an adaption of a high altitude. Suit, well, this or? this too was an, <coughs> an adaptation of the uh, of the uh, high altitude pressure suit. The first true what I call space suit was the advanced uh, version that Ed White wore on his EVA okay. for okay. Gemini Four. Now. When we talk about Gemini 3, invariably folks will say, oh, that's a corned beef sandwich mission. Yeah, the corned beef sandwich mission. Right. But there was something more important here. For the first time, we were going to truly maneuver our spacecraft up in orbit. Up to this time in Mercury, you could uh, control the attitude of the spacecraft and roll and yaw and pitch. But now we wanted to be able to maneuver this vehicle along the X, Y, and Z axis, forwards and backwards, uh, side to side, and up and down. And this would be uh, the job of the orbital attitude maneuvering system, the ohms engines on the adapter section of the Gemini spacecraft. Now, we'll get to this story later, but of course, it was one of these thrusters that failed open on Gemini 8. Mm -hmm. And the way they got past that situation was to activate the little thrusters around the nose of the Gemini capsule. And those were the RCS, which at the time stood for reentry control system. So Armstrong activated those and, and brought the Gemini 8 capsule home. We'll talk about that when we get to Gemini 8. This is over in the trailer of the pseudo trailer oh, pad 16. There. Wally was a backup commander for Gemini 3. And the guys walked in, and here's Wally waiting for him in this beat-up, battered, torn Mercury <laughs> uh, 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 pressure suit. Uh, and he solemnly announced, we, the backup crew, are ready to take over in case you guys chicken out. <laughs> So Wally had gone, gone all through the te uh, the the trouble for that uh, particular gotcha, which was great because it kind of uh, 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 relaxed everyone, got a little bit of the tension out of the air, broke the ice and so forth. So uh, and Wally was always all about that. Anything you could do to maintain an even strain, as he said. Look at Gus's expression. Yeah, yeah this is priceless. <laughs> I hear the guys coming out of the trailer at pad 16, heading over to pad 19 where the launch vehicle is. Now, holding the door there is the uh, public affairs chief, Paul Haney. And if you've ever listened to any of the Gemini missions, you've heard Paul as the voice of mission control, very distinctive voice. He was the chief of public affairs for many years and um, was really responsible for molding the PAO, the public affairs office, into what it eventually uh, became. He was... Uh, by all uh, uh, by all discussion, he was a, a stern taskmaster, uh, mm -hmm. but that was good because you were forming something new, and it it had to be done uh, it had to be done right. Uh, he was eventually uh, his last mission that he covered was Apollo Seven, and if you remember, at one point Wally Sherrod held up the sign that said "Deep Slayton, are you a turtle?" Yes, and they had that typical exchange. Apparently. Um, Paul went into some, uh, I think, deep discussion of what the Turtle Club was all about. And the guys in Washington, D.C. heard that going over the live commentary, and they said, no, we're not going to have that. Huh. And after that, Paul was out. And it was after that, it was John McLeish and Terry White who did the uh, PAO commentary from uh, Johnson Space Center. Well, things going out over the public, yeah. they got to be it. But, yeah, yeah, the turtle thing, you see, you, are you a turtle? And you right. say, you bet your, your sweet, sweet butt I am. Thing. No, you say uh, you bet your sweet ass yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, would yeah. owe me a drink if we were if serious I said, but, about this right ass, now. Yeah. Exactly. So but they, uh, 
This and is we a, actually talk about that in our our Gemini Mercury Gallery right, on the wall yeah. in there. Well, this is yeah. John and Gus coming out of the trail, heading into the uh, no what smoking. the guys call the you bread remember truck. People, you can't be smoking and, around. And uh, taking the Barton Freeway over to Pad 19. Here's Gus in the spacecraft in the left seat as they were getting ready to button the vehicle up. And uh, you're just looking at a picture of a man who is just in his natural element. He is a test pilot. He is getting ready for the first flight of a brand new vehicle, a vehicle he was largely responsible for as far as its design and cockpit layout was concerned. Uh, this was very much a uh, 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 um, uh, a high water mark in anyone's career, particularly in Gus's. And so uh, he was ready to proceed with his mission. And if you listen to the mission tapes, I mean, he was just absolutely professional every step of the way, brought his vehicle back home and... Uh, he was the top, uh, top of the pyramid after that flight. It wasn't as spectacular as 22 Orbits by Gordon Cooper. It wasn't as spectacular as 14 Days on Gemini 7. It was only three orbits, but the accomplishments that he uh, that he was responsible for up there and the flying that he did up there made everything else possible, rendezvous, docking, and eventually getting to the moon. And as you look at the mission, you realize Gus Grissom was the very first space pilot in history so that is uh that to me is a is a high water point of his uh heritage absolutely well put there you have yeah. a question for nick thomas marty you have, have a, a question, question from uh, uh clyde lewis, lewis. Nick, nick it's, it's great, great having you on the show today i was wondering if you have any memories of the filming of the don knotts movie on the cape in 1966 the great night what's that the reluctant astronaut yeah. is that what it was the called great, the great uh Shot of Apollo 1 on a pad in that film. I'd have to go back. I've got the DVD somewhere, so I'd have to go back and watch it again. It's been many years since I saw it. <laughs> I just remember that one of the, uh, the the chief officials in charge of Don's flight was Leslie Nielsen, our yeah. friend Captain Drebin from Police Squad, uh, still in his relatively serious part of his career. But uh, I'd have to go back and look. I know, I know some of that was shot at... Uh, Man's great man spacecraft center in Houston, but again, I have to go back and take a look at that. But uh, you can't go wrong with a Don Knotts. Don Knotts for like the astronaut. Is. That's a good one, right yeah. there. With his ghost and Mrs. Chicken, Mr. And then, Chicken, yeah, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chicken, and all that. Uh, but uh, good. Thank you for bringing in uh, pop culture. Yeah. See, this Ge Gemini was really when the pop culture of space it was, was really uh, that and the Beatles and, mm -hmm. and all this going on at the same time was happy. Stuff. The space program uh, was infused that. into our popular yeah, it culture. It certainly was in, at this time. Sure. Um, all right. We got another rookie astronaut here to become the, quite famous. John Young, the first of the Group 2 astronauts to fly, uh, born in San Francisco, raised uh, in Orlando. I think he went to high school in Orlando. Yeah. And he said that for years and years and years, people who would there would be people who drove on the John Young Parkway, and these little old ladies who would write to him and say, "You've got to take better care of your parkway." It's like, it's, "Lady, it's not my highway, please." Yeah. But uh, uh, a remarkable consummate professional, uh, very much in the mold of Gus Grissom, a man of very few words, but whenever he said something, you could you could bet the farm on it. Uh, a remarkable pilot and test pilot. Two Geminis, two Apollos, a walk on the moon, two space shuttle missions, by far our most experienced uh, uh, astronaut. And again, like Tom Stafford, just a national treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, we miss him. Passed yeah. away f about four years ago. and uh, But we think of him every day with the John Young Parkway in yeah. the news. There's a wreck on it every day, it seems. Well, like I, I tend to have my <laughs> memories of John from yeah. another plane rather Absolutely. than accidents on a highway. Yeah. There's the launch of Gemini 3 off of Pad 19. Uh, this this vehicle, the Titan II, was a uh, modified intercontinental ballistic missile designed originally to carry uh, nuclear warheads to their targets. And as such, it carried storable propellants, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, which would combust upon contact with one another. They were very volatile and the fumes were very dangerous. Uh, I was told that if the stuff got on your skin, it could kill you. And in the background there, the base of the pad, you can see what veterans referred to as the uh, BFRC, the big freaking red cloud. <laughs> and if you ever saw this red cloud floating around, you got into a place and 
and hunker down because that was highly, highly toxic stuff. Now in the foreground, you can see the erector tower uh, laid down fully on the base of Pad 19. And as you look toward the top, the upper third of that tower is the White Room. And that White Room is now on display at the Cape Canaveral Air Force or Space Force Museum over on uh, Cape Canaveral. I've been in that uh, White Room several times and look at it in comparison to all the pictures I've seen of the crews up there. And you can identify every level, every set of stairs and every uh, uh, workplace on, inside that White Room. Good display, so a special tour to get out there to well, see that, right? it's it was wonderful to be able to uh, step inside that thing and just literally, and yeah, literally walk in the footsteps of 10 Gemini crews. That's it's right. A remarkable piece of That's hardware. Right. It certainly is. Great, great part of our history. It's one of the pictures that John took up on orbit, and as I recall, this is over Madagascar, and it's kind of uh, emblematic of what the worldwide weather light was like that day. It was all clouds and water and gus said yep there ain't much water either <laughs> uh, i think the only clear spot they hit was over new mexico arizona someplace like that but for the rest of the world it was just very very uh, uh cloudy uh, these are the two wives uh in the viewing room of the houston mission control which was being was part of the communications network during gemini 3 but not the control center uh betty grissom there on the left and barbara young there on the right uh it's interesting, some of the labels I see there on the wall is, I think, Captain Isley, and on the uh, chair that Barbara's in, I think that's Mrs. Cooper, so they must have had a series of VIPs come through uh, for that event, uh, but these are uh, uh, the wives of the flight crew. And this is on board the uh, USS Intrepid after a highly, highly successful three-orbit test flight of the Gemini spacecraft, uh, John and Gus uh, in the uh, uh, blue flight suits uh, that I think I first saw worn by John Glenn. And you can see this design with the uh, highlights, black highlights on the zippers. That eventually went away, uh, I think, by Gemini 5 or Gemini 6. But you can see that classic astronaut flight suit taking shape. And unlike the shuttle program, the flight suits weren't worn at a drop of a hat by an astronaut. So normally they just wore the band lawn shirts and the uh, go to hell uh, slacks. But uh, uh, later on, of course, in the shuttle program, when you wanted the crew, with, particularly when you had the crew at a, uh, say, tour of the OPF or something like that, you know, they were to be dressed in their flight suits. But this was one of the earliest iterations of the flight suits and one very familiar to you because yeah. uh, we have, uh, there, we there it is, there's uh, Gus's brother Lowell with Gus's flight suit just next door here in the museum. Yeah. And again, you can see that layout with the, uh, the very thick Velcro belt, which got a little thinner in time, the black highlighted zippers, the classic NASA emblem of the NASA, classic NASA meatball with the white uh, uh, piping around it. And uh, yeah, sure enough, you, you can come here to the museum and yeah. see Gus's flight suit on display here. Picture on the wall is he with his family. With his family were, wearing it. Wearing that flight and, suit. Uh, yeah. Virgil, his brother there a couple years ago. Lowell. was I mean, Lowell, yeah. Lowell, his brother, uh, was here this year. Right. And uh, he's got a Gus Mobile sweatshirt. The sweatshirt, there, yeah. But, uh, yep. that's, they had a nickname, Gus <laughs> Mobile, because he designed the... The cockpit. The cockpit the was basically built around him, and the yeah. first four production uh, models that came off the line were basically sized to Gus. And Tom Stafford got in one of these things, <laughs> and Tom's six foot tall, and that hatch kept hitting him in the head. So <laughs> that's, why, that's one of the reasons it was called the Gus Mobile. They had a unique way of identifying where the spacecraft was from the air. That... Yeah, you've got the green dye marker there. And in this picture, you can see John in the life raft. Um, they were in that spacecraft for quite some time after splashdown, and those suits were very hot and very uncomfortable. And, of course, Gus kept the hatches closed yeah, until right. properly, as he should have, until the frogmen got the flotation collar on the spacecraft. Well, by that time, by the time they did open the hatches, they had doffed those pressure suits and were stripped down to their long johns. And you can see John has, if you look closely, John has modified his long johns. He's cut the sleeves off. He's got short sleeves where, where Gus didn't. Huh. But in this picture, Gus has already been winched up into the hel uh, recovery helicopter, and John's waiting his turn. When they got in the helicopter, they were given blue medical robes with the caduceus on it. And uh, when they got off the helicopter, somebody said they looked like a couple of Shriners who woke up after a big hangover <laughs> at a convention in New York City. Yeah. 
There's been three orbits around the Earth in a new spacecraft. Yeah. And yeah. it was a nominal mission, uh -huh. and we were on our way to testing the things we need to learn to go to the moon. Yeah, John and Gus were eventually cycled into the backup crew for Gemini 6. But then after that, Gus was cycled directly into the Apollo program. He could put him straight into the Apollo program to make as much use of his expertise and knowledge as possible. And of course, John went to be commander of uh, Gemini 10. Gemini yeah. 10 with uh, uh, Mike Collins. Mike Collins right? yeah. uh, here we are, Gemini 8. Uh, Another the, mission of March. Probably one of the most beautiful patches of the Gemini program. Very, very colorful, very, very imaginative. You can see the constellation of Castor and Pollux up in the top, and their star light is being reflected through the prism to a rainbow version of the number seven followed by the number eight. A beautiful, very gorgeous, and very imaginative patch, which I'm very mm -hmm. proud to be wearing today. Cool, excellent. Yeah. yeah the colors look great on yeah. your shirt. And of course, our, our crew, uh, Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott. Uh, Neil, uh, again, from the second group of astronauts, and like Jim McDivitt, he is a rookie making his first flight as a commander, which says a lot about his capability. Of course, Neil came from the U.S. Navy as a naval aviator. Uh, he was also a, a NASA research pilot for the X-15 program, and now in the second group of astronauts commanding Gemini 8, along with uh, his pilot, uh, Dave Scott, who would go on to land on the moon on Apollo 15, also fly on Apollo 9, one of yeah. our March missions that we'll talk yeah. about later he, on. He flew twice in the month of March. Yeah. And here, um, Dave was originally scheduled to perform the first test of what was called the AMU, the Astronaut Maneuvering Unit. Uh, this was something that they were that they moved on to Gemini 9 after Gemini 8 was terminated early. Um, it, the AMU never did fly, and it did not fly as a as an entity, if you will, until the Skylab program when we tested out what would eventually become the Man Maneuvering Unit. But of course, the idea of this was to be able to maneuver freely uh, in space. Uh, in looking back, Gene Cernan, talking about the AMU, said, you know, that was really a bridge too far too soon. He said, if I had been able to get into that thing and fly with it, we probably would have had more difficulties than we were anticipating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot going on there with thrusters in the back, and you had a special suit just in case you burn the back. And all uh, that well, the stuff. legs were made of yeah. uh, of, uh, of woven uh, metal, yeah. so we we call they call Gino old iron pants. <laughs> That's right. All right, Marty. Question. You got a question from Gary Gerald. Nick, what were the benefits of having mission control at the Cape versus in Houston? Well, it was good having mission control at the Cape because everything was consolidated and everything was in the same place. But we come to a point, certainly with Gemini, when we realized that much of this work had to be moved to other locations because you couldn't ask one center like Kennedy or Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center to handle vehicle preparation, vehicle integration, vehicle launch, vehicle recovery, and mission control. So the decision was made, I think quite rightfully, to move mission control elsewhere. Now, the question as to where it was moved, we can you know, bat that around day in and day out. It ended up in Houston because of the patronage, not only of Lyndon Johnson, but also the congressional uh, uh, contingent from Texas. Uh, uh, I think uh, Jack Brooks and several other people who were very, very much in favor of the space program and fought for it in Congress. So moving the mission control uh, center to Texas, uh, it did make sense because we had a wellspring of support there, not only in the Houston area itself, but also the Texas contingent in Congress. Um, I think it made life a lot easier for a lot of folks. I think it was easier to consolidate these things during Mercury, but when you started to add the complexity that you had in the Gemini missions, it was probably best to take that off of uh, Cape Canaveral's plate and move it elsewhere. Good question there, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along here with the launch breakfast. Yeah, launch breakfast. A <clears throat> great tradition going back to Mercury. Uh, on the left, we see uh, Roger Chaffee in the white shirt and beyond him, Dave Scott. And on the right in the fore, uh, just beyond Dave Scott, by the way, the fellow in the blue sweater is Alan Shepard, chief of the astronaut office. And then on the right side, we've got uh, uh, director of flight crew operations, Deke Slayton. After him, Neil Armstrong. 
Uh, in the red shirt is astronaut Kurt Michael, who, who did not fly. And then beyond, just past Kurt, is uh, Walt Cunningham. And I suspect they served some uh, 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 work on the uh, support crew for this mission. Mm -hmm. Up on uh, the White Room, there's that stairway in the White Room of Pad 19. And you've got uh, Dave Scott with a golden EVA visor on his, uh, on top of his helmet. And Neil Armstrong on the right. And between them, the backup crew of uh, Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon. Uh, as the crew gets ready to board the Gemini 8 spacecraft out there on pad 19. Great shot. Yeah. You're looking at you there. And Neil Armstrong in the left seat. Uh, phew, uh, what can you say about Neil Armstrong that hasn't been said already? Not only an incredibly gifted pilot and test pilot, but also quite simply the ideal man to be the first man on the moon. A man of, of uh, humility, very quiet man. Uh, you know, for for one reason or another, we don't seem to celebrate sto male stoicism as we used to in the society. We don't celebrate the Gary Cooper archetype. But Neil was all that, and he was just the ideal man to be the first man on the moon because he carried that mantle with such dignity. Uh, it just to, And history always seems to provide those people for us. Charles Lindbergh, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, Eileen Collins. I mean, the list just goes on and on of the right people who come along at the right time in history to perform the right job. And Neil was certainly all of that. Yes, iconic people who teach you a lot about humility yeah. and, and, and handling their fame. You bet. Uh, like he did uh, uh, becoming, because so many people put them up there. Thousands and thousands well, of people. These were the Marty kind of Winkles, your your space workers, your other people, they, they recognize that. These are the kind of people we were looking up to when we were kids. Yeah. And this was just a great time to be growing up because we had great role models. We had great heroes, as we called them back in those days. We didn't yeah. call them role models. Uh, but we had these people who led the way. And you realize that even if you weren't going to become an astronaut, you could apply that same sense of excellence to whatever you ended up doing. Yeah. I mean, you could be the Neil Armstrong of all postal delivery men or what have you. you. You take that sense of excellence that you see uh, highlighted in these missions and you apply it to what you do in your everyday life. And the world is just a better place because of it. And one thing that you're doing here is something never been done before, the unknown being explored. With yeah. a lot of a lot of plans that, like <laughs> Nick says, didn't come to fruition, the spacewalk. But uh you know, those lessons learned were applied to the next mission. Yeah, very important lessons learned. And uh, even though Gemini 8 was a, what could not be considered as a success, uh, the problems and the way we reacted to them were great lessons, things that we learned, the importance of the close uh, linkage between mission control and the flight crew, but also more importantly, the ability of the flight crew to deal with the crisis because when the spin started up, they were out of communication range. They were in between tracking sites. And by the time we did reacquire communication with them, Neil was saying, you know, we've got serious problems here. We're steadily increasing in the left yaw. And um, it was very there's important. A, there's those, the, the docking and the picture Nick's, uh, Nick's talking about. Yeah, here. the Agena uh, 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 docking target. <laughs> and, of course, the plan was to dock with this Agena rocket ignite its uh, engine in space and boost yourself up to a higher orbit, which we eventually did in later Gemini missions. Uh, here we see the uh, Gemini vehicle closing in on the uh, docking target. <coughs> Pardon me, you can see the dipole antenna there at the top of the Agena, and obscured is the uh, series of lights at the control panel of the Agena, which uh, 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 told you about the status of the vehicle as you closed in on it, as you docked, and as you were uh, locked with the uh, with the spacecraft. This is dramatically shown out at the wow. Astronaut Hall of Fame in the movie you may have seen out there, but it was a close call, Nick, really. These yeah. guys were, uh, uh, this is why test pilots do mm -hmm. this, and not yeah. uh, like Neil Armstrong being an X-15 test pilot. They keep doing what they got to do. They're not yeah. thinking about dying. They want to get all the information down to the ground before. Well, there's the a great a great story I heard when I was learning how to fly, and the difference, talking about the difference between a pilot and a test pilot. A pilot says, "I've got thirty seconds before I crash." 
a test pilot says, "Hey, I got thirty seconds. I bet I could save this thing." Yeah. So that's the kind of that's the kind of person you need on board a flight like this. We had the situation where that one OAMS uh, Ohms thruster failed open and put the vehicle into the uh, increasing yaw because since it failed open, that acceleration was getting greater and greater and greater uh, as long as that uh, engine was firing. Neil finally shut down the primary uh, ohm system and then activated his reentry thrusters, which you see there in this picture on the nose of the Gemini, and used those to regain control of the vehicle. And then once he got the vehicle stabilized, he went through the ohm thrusters one at a time until he located that one errant thruster, shut it off again, regained control. But the mission rule said that once you activated that uh, RCS fuel system, you were coming home. So the crew landed in the, uh, I think it was in the South the South China Sea. They were covered by a destroyer, the Leonard F. Mason. <laughs> and uh, I think, in fact, they uh, might have splashed down a lot closer to Red China than we would have liked to in those days. But here we see the crew in the water. Uh, it's remarkable. I always enjoy this picture because they both have smiles on their I know, face. No, you can't believe they just <laughs> you, cheated you, death. Yeah, exactly, exactly so. But, uh, you know, there is a... There is an expression test pilots use and say, well, cheated death again today. <laughs> and I'll bet you dollars to donuts that one of those guys said that while they were bobbing up there, uh, yeah. bobbing up and down on the yeah. water there. But here they are. It's the hatches are open. You got the flotation collar in place, and they're about to be brought on board the uh, Leonard F. Mason. And what's hard, Nick, for anyone maybe under 40 years old to understand was there was not a communications network. Yeah. This near tragedy happened uh, out of radar range. <laughs> They would put uh, ships at sea with radar yeah, dishes. Gemini sea. did have these 84-inch yeah. dishes that they were building <laughs> and all over installations around the world, close to the equator, where most of the missions would be flying. And people uh, don't realize that even during Apollo, when we were still in Earth orbit, there were still uh, areas of uh, blackout blackouts, as far as communication yeah. was concerned. Yeah. Now, we had steady communication as we got into the deep space network when the crew were on their way to the moon. But we didn't have reliable... 24-hour minute-by-minute communication until the tracking and data relay system that was brought on uh, brought up during the uh, shuttle program. And there are a lot of shuttle astronauts who wish they would have flown back in the old days when they had a little peace and quiet from time to time. <laughs> March 1966, and three years later, in a couple months, Neil Armstrong would be the commander of Apollo 11 going to the moon. After yeah, this yeah flight, absolutely so. remarkable career. And here's the crew. Here's uh, Neil and Dave uh, on board with the uh, recovery team uh, that secured their spacecraft in the water. Uh, back in those days, we called them frogmen. Today, they're called Navy SEALs, oh, but okay. they're just as tough. They're just as resilient, and uh, uh, as as much as their uh, 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 antecedents in the you SEAL know, program. <clears throat> yeah, you know, we love space history, Nick. I'm just thinking the families of these three young men. Yeah have talked about this yeah. all their lives oh yeah my dad we, was with neil armstrong we have but, people, we have i mean that's what it's all about is the recovery it? ship yeah. and so forth yeah. and that is an incredible part of their family <clears throat> heritage and uh the remarkable pride of these uh family members who can step forward and say yeah my uh my dad helped recover uh a crew at sea he was on board the wasp or he's <laughs> on board the intrepid here we are at uh in hawaii uh the crew came off the uh Mason and were uh, went to Hickam Field, I believe, in Hawaii, and from there they flew back to uh, to Houston. And again, looking at these guys talking very calm, calmly and very cheerfully, you wouldn't know they had just come away from the first major in-flight emergency of the manned space program. But that's why, again, that's why you got test pilots doing this work. But everything worked during the emergency the way it was supposed to. Well, it was a lot of it. I think was on the part of the decision-making process of Neil Armstrong, uh, they were in a situation where that that uh, uh, that roll, that tumble was was becoming so accelerated, they really were in danger of, of passing out. And I don't know that it was in the mission rules to activate the uh, RCS in an emergency uh, situation like that, but certainly Neil saw that as being probably the last thing he could do before the crew blacked out. And again, uh, steel nerves, ice cold water in the veins, uh, steely eyed missile men, however you want to put it. But uh, this is why you this is why you have test pilots doing a job. Like Going that. through their checklists that they know is to, to try to make things work. Well, 
Another real interesting mission of uh, a March also put us solidly on the path to the moon. Marty Winkles worked on the lunar module LEM number three. four. As a LEM three. <clears throat> Yeah, LM3, yeah. LM3, yes. Yeah, and here's a very distinctive patch for Apollo 9 with Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott again, and Rusty Schweikert. Uh, really, what I've heard referred to, and I, I love this description, someone called it a connoisseur's mission. It had everything you wanted as a test pilot astronaut. It had rendezvous, it had docking, it had the first flight of a true spacecraft, it had a uh, a, a flight profile whereby the two vehicles had to come back together and dock successfully because the LEM certainly couldn't re-enter the atmosphere. So it had everything you wanted as a test pilot. Uh, I remember in the uh, TV series From the Earth to the Moon, I think uh, Dave Scott is portrayed as saying, yeah, our mission is fun. And I think as a pilot, as a test pilot, yeah, I think that's an apt a uh, uh, description of the Apollo 9 mission. Again, it's everything that you would want as a test pilot and three remarkable men to, to fly the mission, just the absolute cream of the crop to fly this uh, uh, first flight of a brand new vehicle. Uh, Jim McDivitt here, Dave Scott, and uh, Rusty Schweikert. Rusty's first flight, uh, he was a civilian test pilot, but uh, again, he was as the lunar module pilot he was going to be responsible not only for the checkout and uh, assisting in the first flight of this vehicle, but also to perform a spacewalk, which we'll talk about later. Here's a wonderful picture. That previous picture is the picture that everyone knows of the Apollo 9 crew. This is, I think, the picture that always comes up. But this one, they took a little closer to the Saturn V, and uh, you could almost say the Saturn V is the star of this picture. But uh, uh, a great uh, image of the crew out there at Pad 39A with the Saturn V, the second Saturn V, five to fly with uh, human beings on board, and uh, just a remarkable picture of uh, what we uh, what we had to look forward to on this flight. Uh, here's uh, Jim and Rusty in the lunar module. Fish eye uh, see that often. Uh, this could be uh, here at KSC in the flight crew training building or at Johnson, but uh, here in the foreground we see Jim Divot in the background, uh, Rusty Schweikert. Just above Jim's head is a rendezvous window uh, that would be used for the rendezvous uh, with the uh, 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 command service module. And we'll show you an illustration of that later on. If you look uh, just to the left of the picture, you'll see uh, a yellow uh, handrail, and that's around the uh, optical uh, telescope that would be used for star sightings in uh, setting up the uh, uh, navigational platform uh, for the uh, lunar module. And as I've said before, the LEM is just a wonderful statement in uh, elegant, the elegance of simplicity. Now, of course, they are under constraints. This vehicle had to be extremely lightweight, so you couldn't have any extraneous bells, buzzers, or whistles on this spacecraft. Everything on that spacecraft had to be mission focused. Had to be had to do with the uh, with the mission itself. So uh, this vehicle, I think, again, in, in its ele elegance of simplicity was just the right tool for the right job. And again, a lot of that is uh, is due to the efforts of the team at Grumman who built this vehicle. And yeah, it, it, it took a little longer to get this vehicle flying than we would have uh, planned for originally. There were a lot of complications in this spacecraft. It was very complex. I won't say it was complicated, but it was complex. Complex as a pilot, I'll take. Com uh, complicated, I don't want. But uh, uh, here are the two guys flying that first test flight of the world's first true spacecraft. It could only work in space. It could only fly in space. And Jim McDivitt on one occasion told me that it was really wild to look down at that in ingress-egress hatch down below and to see it slightly bulged under the air pressure of the, <laughs> the cabin pressure. But that's how, uh, that's how thin that vehicle was. It was fragile. But... Uh, Boy, it was what I call mission dedicated. It was a remarkable accomplishment and uh, uh, not only got us on the moon, but got us home uh, with Apollo 13. Absolutely. The proof of its endurance and, yeah. and overbuild would be yeah. Apollo 13 for sure. Uh, here's the crew going out. There's... Getting into the uh, bread truck uh, out at the uh, operations and checkout building. Uh, Jim McDivitt uh, bidding uh, Dave Scott to enter first and Rusty Schweikert bringing up the rear. 
and in the back, Chief Astronaut Alan B. Shepard. Now, this is in 1969, so by this time, Shepard was medically requalified to get back onto flight status. Now, at this point, I don't know if he had said anything about that, because for a long time, he didn't say anything about it. He just started showing up at flight briefings. He started getting simulator time, and everybody looked around. They said, oh, Alan Shepard is coming back. So at this point in that picture, I don't know if Shepard has uh, uh, opened up the secret that he is uh, back on flight status, but uh, if he hadn't by then, it, it will soon be knowledge in the astronaut office. But his was the guiding hand of that office for so many years. He was known to be, uh, I'll say it, he was known to be a hard ass as chief astronaut. In fact, I talked to, uh, uh, oh gosh, our old friend from uh, NASA who used to be here, who oversaw the Grumman uh, team, the Lem, who was that, Marty? Charlie Mars. Charlie Mars, yeah. And Charlie had heard of Al Shepard's reputation of being a hard ass and hard to deal with. And he was just absolutely surprised when he worked with Al Shepard on 14. He said he was the nicest guy. He's just a member of the crew. <laughs> and But if you stop and think about Shepard's position as chief astronaut, he was responsible for maintaining discipline in this team. And let's face it, Alan Shepard knew where all the shortcuts were and knew all the kind of stuff that could be pulled as far as behavior and misbehavior. And uh, following in the mold of Deke Slayton, he ran a very tight ship, and he had to. Mm -hmm. So I don't begrudge him that reputation one bit. He was, a right, again, right man for the, for the right job. And there he is following the crew out to the uh, mm -hmm. transfer van. I've been told that his secretary at the astronaut office, Lola Morrill, uh, that she would tilt a, if he was in a bad mood, she would take a picture, yeah. certain picture, and make sure Outside it was tilted. The office. All right. yeah, he had two pictures. He had a smiling owl, and you had a very intense and stern owl. Oh. And depending upon what his mood of the day was, she put that picture up in the uh, 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 frame outside the office. And so astronauts coming by would look at that picture and sometimes say, yeah, I'll see him tomorrow. Yeah. And, right. and I remember distinctly uh, Jack Lausma telling me the story when he was uh, went to meet Alan Shepard the uh, first time after he'd been selected. He had asked for an appointment with Al and he walked into the office and I think he literally stood at attention at the desk, and Shepard looked up and he said, "Major, state your business in five words or less." <laughs> really? <laughs> and, and I'm sure Jack lost my dead. I'm sure he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> God bless him. Yeah. All right, let's get these boys up to space on this very important mission that the manager of the Apollo program, Sam Phillips, called the most perfect mission wow. ever flown. Yeah, just, just really incredible. This is actually taken during the countdown demonstration test well before the launch. You can see the guys are getting out of the spacecraft. Jim has doffed his, glove, his gloves and his helmet. And just to Jim's right, or just to the right of Jim, is our friend Gunther Wendt, the pad mm -hmm. leader, uh, out there at pad 39A. Uh, again, another... Uh, a, a presence that you saw in that white room, and it was just sort of like, yeah, everything's going to be okay. Gunther is on the case. Here's the launch of Apollo 9. This was actually the very first launch I witnessed uh, in person as a young boy oh, across okay. the river here in Titusville. We had seen Apollo 8 on television. We saw it climb up over the palm trees uh, from our home in Daytona Beach. And I think at that point, Dad realized where my life was headed decided, well, we need to get him out there to see these things. And subsequently, we started with Apollo 9 and went on to see every Saturn V launch uh, after that. You were over there at J.C. Penney's? Just uh, across uh, from J.C. Uh, Penney's. Where what was that like? Uh, oh, boy. You saw it was that a morning launch, correct? Yeah, yeah. You saw that vehicle out on the pad, and it just, even from 12 miles away, it had a presence of power and, I'll say, even of uh, 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 stateliness, uh regalness, uh, I, I guess I would call it. But you saw all that potential power sitting on the launch pad. And finally, when the engines lit at about T minus six seconds, you saw this flame come shooting through the flame trench. You saw the smoke in the air and the vehicle finally left the pad at zero. It took 14 seconds for that vehicle to cross the top of the launch tower. I mean, that's how agonizing. slow and majestic it was. And talk about agonizing. <laughs> Uh, 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 Al Warden told me that that launch, the one thing you thought about during launch was you didn't want to contact that, recontact that uh, launch tower. 
and particularly on Apollo 15's pictures from some of the angles, you can see that yaw profile, that slight yaw profile they went in to get away from that tower as quick as they could. Uh, Al was asked, you know, we all know 7.5 million pounds of thrust, so the younger generation would ask Al about launching on that vehicle, and they were under the impression that your face muscles were being pulled back, and it was a terrible instantaneous 9G through the chest. He said, no, take off on a Saturn V. You ever been with your mother in the car and at a stoplight, and the light turned green, she left her foot off the brake, and the car started moving? She said, that's what a Saturn V launch felt like. You weren't <laughs> really? instantaneously at 17,500 miles per hour. Took a while to get there. But uh, certainly as you headed uphill, and yeah, that G acceleration went through your chest and finally got up, I think, in the uh, Saturn V case, up to about... 7.5 and maybe even 8 G's of acceleration. Yeah. Uh, it definitely uh, got your attention. I love this picture. Uh, every time you see uh, uh, the limb uh, snuggled up into the Saturn V, it's with a black void of space behind it because we had done this after we had performed the translunar injection burn and we're on our way to the moon. But this was the only time that we saw this spectacular vehicle uh, truly in the shadow of the Earth, in Earth orbit. And here we are as the crew has turned around. Dave Scott is about to perform the docking uh, with the lunar module. Again, another first, another exciting thing you had to look forward to. And uh, he's going to put that uh, probe in the nose of the command module inside the drogue, the receptacle on top of the lunar module. And once those two vehicles are hard docked with 12 good latches, then you initiate the, the, the pyros to release the vehicle from the Saturn V or from the S-4B and then you back out of it. But gorgeous picture. Again, here's uh, Rusty Schweikert during that EVA to test the uh, the uh, uh, A-7L uh, lunar suit. Now, originally, this uh, a spacewalk was going to include an EVA transfer from the LEM to the command module because we wanted to be sure that we had a method that was reliable in case the tunnel was inaccessible. So you can see in this picture the silver L-shaped rail that leads up to the mm -hmm. uh, uh, top of the lunar module. And Rusty was going to use that to climb hand over hand to the command module and enter the hatch there with that backpack and everything else on it. Well, Rusty had had a case of space adaptation sickness uh, two days prior to this. <clears throat> so it was decided to hold off. And then when he was feeling better, they decided they'd go ahead with the EVA, but they were going to skip the EVA transfer. We we're just going to take the suit out, test it, and uh, test those foot restraints, what they call the golden slippers in the front porch. And this is one of the pictures that was taken of Rusty by Dave Scott, who stood up in the hatch of the command module and took these pictures. Rusty's got a hostile blood in his hand there. Yeah. He's written that he said he assessed the situation. He felt that he could do that yeah. maneuver without any problem. Yeah. And here's another picture, uh, again, uh, taken by Dave Scott, because you can see the uh, EVA rail there in the foreground. And that uh, beautiful red helmet, which I think is the only time that you see a red helmet in the uh, uh, Apollo program. I think the next time I saw a red helmet with an Apollo pressure suit was in the motion picture Marooned. Oh, right. But nevertheless, uh, another beautiful picture of this all-important test of the uh, uh, Apollo lunar suit. And again... First time we had done an EVA without an umbilical hose. Uh, yes. Rusty's O2 and his cooling and so forth are all in that backpack. That's right. And uh, they did an EVA at, from the, the other side in the CM. Yeah, they yeah were Dave connected, was on the command module uh, but side. But he didn't exactly. use a backpack. He was connected with the hose. So that's the first and only test of the, the lunar module suit, and they felt real confident after this. Yeah. Marty, you have a question? Uh, Tom, Tom Usiak does. does. Hey, Tom. Nick, Nick from my Mike guess, <laughs> I'm sorry. My guess is the best, the best views from Titusville would have been Apollo 16, 16 and 17 because of the light, was the lighting and the fact 17 was the night launch. Am I close? 17 was unique. 17 was a sunrise and a second and a half. Uh, now, my favorite pictures of the Apollo 17 launch are not of the vehicle itself. My favorite pictures are the films that were shot of the spectators watching that launch, and they are lit up just like daylight. And that's exactly what it was like. Yeah. It was like nothing you'd ever experienced before. The power and the majesty of that incredible light show. <laughs> 
was something that we had never experienced and wouldn't experience again until the uh, uh, space shuttle program. Uh, that's the memory that I have of that night launch of 17. And we were scheduled to go. I, it was scheduled for a night launch, but then, as I recall, it was delayed for a couple of hours. We had a problem on the pad. I don't know if it was uh, ground support equipment or, or what. But uh, that even that launch when we did go was delayed. I think it was just past midnight. But yeah, I'd have to, like to go back and check. And yeah, it was like midnight. Yeah, the only one delayed too that didn't go off on time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, very uh, reliable. About, uh, all of that happened to work right. They yeah. never did have a scrub of a yeah. Saturn V. Yeah, amazing. Tom Usiak, thanks for your comment there. Tommy you, was Tom. uh, reminding us, Nick, that forty-five years ago yesterday, Columbia arrived. For the first time oh, at Kennedy gosh. Space Center yeah. in uh, uh, 1979. Uh, 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 at launch, we talked to, we were talking about that and a wonderful story I heard about John Young during that piggyback ride to uh, KSC from California. And it was going to, of course, fly over Houston. And John was giving an interview in his office and his secretary came in and said, Captain Young, I just want to let you know the space shuttle is going to pass overhead in about 10 <laughs> minutes. And John just said, oh, I reckon I've seen that before. But about five minutes later, during the interview, he just got up and he went to the window and he waited for it to fly over. He saw it fly over. <laughs> Can't resist. Yeah. Uh, and you'll never, ever see it again. So those are two that old. did. Marty, a question. Yeah, a question from Steve Jokum. How much truth lies behind the idea that the Apollo Soyuz test project flight was based on Nixon seeing marooned. I have heard that story, but uh, I don't know how much of a of a factor that was in the decision the decision to fly ASTP. Um, it's like <laughs> it's like people who say Nixon's decision to go into Cambodia was because he saw Patton a couple of nights before the motion picture. So I really have no idea as to the validity of that uh, of that question. No, I don't. Well, thanks for asking. And uh, we got uh, this important mission in 1971 uh, that yeah. was putting us back on track in March. I mean, 72, uh, excuse me, uh, 69. I'm, I'm all messed up there. 69 okay. is what we're doing here right. in March. And then, of course, uh, we do the barnstorm in the moon in May, in, in April or uh -huh. May, and then July we do the landing. Yeah. So uh, here here's a picture taken uh, of Rusty by Jim McDivitt, and you can see the scribe marks of the LPD in Jim's window. That's the landing point designator, and people look at that and they say, "Well, gee, wouldn't you be a little cross-eyed looking through those two grids?" Well, the idea was when the computer gave you the readouts of say 30 degrees, 35 degrees, you had to align that grid with what would be your landing point at that time. Now, because of your body position, you could get into a parallax situation and look at that LPD in the wrong angle and get the wrong idea where your landing point was. So the idea was to line those two LPD scribe sets together. And once they were aligned properly, now you're looking at the two 30 or 35 degrees or whatever the computer was, uh, was giving you. Again, a beautiful, eloquent, but simple solution to a problem, you know, what if he's looking at it at the wrong angle? Right. Well, let's do this, align let's, the two LBDs yeah, and we're there. put it up on the, yeah. the window there. Yeah. And uh, very uh, pragmatic and easy to do. Uh, this is a television uh, image taken during the initial LEM checkout with uh, Jim on the right and Rusty on the, on the left. Uh, I put this in because, uh, boy, oh boy, these black and white pictures of the early Apollo program were just breathtaking for us uh, growing up with. This was just, oh, sure, this wasn't high def as we know it today, but this was just absolutely yeah. amazing. The idea that this image was coming to us from space in real time. Uh, and so I think I put this in to kind of remind the young people what to appreciate because, you know, you've got your high def views right now and you know, we didn't always have that kind of technology. This is what we had to, to, uh, to go with. And as, uh, Dana Carvey said, as the uh, grumpy old man, that's what we had, and we liked it. Yeah, and we liked it. It's exactly right. That's but it. here they are during that initial checkout. Uh, I think this uh, might be after Rusty's initial bout of SAS. But uh, in this picture, he's, he's looking pretty good. But again, they took the care to 
let this settle down over a day or two. And then when Rusty was feeling up to it, they went ahead and performed the uh, EVA. But quite aside from that EVA, we're just getting to the main part of the of the uh, bout, as they say in the fight game. Uh, we're getting ready to undock and fly away from the command and service module. Once again, Nick, an unknown, this space <laughs> adaption sickness yeah. uh, that uh, you've talked to so many of the shuttle astronauts. Some just some it bothers and some it doesn't you and never, those that bother it the other ones don't laugh at them or make fun of them they realize hey that's right you'll be okay in a couple of days yeah. and whatnot but you, you uh, couldn't tell who was going to get it and who wasn't you yeah. got you got the macho thing you've got that. you got steve stunning the test pilot who's got cast iron guts and has done everything in the airplane you can think of he gets up on orbit and he starts puking then you have casper milktoast the scientist from uh, 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 the university who goes up into space and doesn't have a problem. Yeah. You can't tell who's going to get it. Yeah. And uh, it's just simply a part of the game. And like you say, it's understood. This is a possibility yeah. that could happen. And you just, you deal with it. I love it when we talk to astronauts like John Blaha, you say, I was made to be in yeah. space. I yeah. loved every moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John so, and Fred Gregory and yeah. people like that, they were, and Story. Yeah, yeah. they just said, yeah. I just I just felt so normal, normal up there. Yeah. Oh, here's a beautiful picture, again, with the Earth in the background and the unique quality of Apollo 9, the LEM in Earth orbit. Uh, this beautiful spacecraft with uh, all of the appendages down on the landing gear, you can see the six-foot-long probes that when you landed on the moon, those probes would light up that little blue light in the cockpit that said lunar contact, and you heard the call contact light. Uh, up on the top of the vehicle, uh, at the top of the nose is rendezvous radar, uh, to the left is a steerable S-band antenna, and nestled around that vehicle are a number of what were called Omni antennas uh, for uh, for uh, communication. Uh, the one thing this LEM is missing that we'll see on later vehicles are the uh, deflector chutes, I'll call them, underneath the reaction control system jets on the ascent stage. Uh, they found some difficulties with the RCS system in on this flight, and they came up with the idea of adding those deflector chutes, and uh, that uh, that solved the problem. But again, just one of the many things you found out uh, uh, about this vehicle during its maiden flight, not only its problems or limitations, but also its capabilities. And it was just stunning to realize that we now had two men in this vehicle flying a good distance away from the command service module, and they had no other choice but to get back and dock with that CSM, or they right. weren't coming home. They weren't coming home. Yeah. How was it to uh, hear from the horses? I understand you did a little tour with Marty Winkle and looked at oh, Lunar Module God. 9 out what there. A what was day. it like to, what a day. to hear from the horse's mouth about was, that vehicle? Oh, it, it was great. We went all over that vehicle, and Marty would talk about not only the systems that were visible, but the systems that were not visible on that vehicle, the vehicle's capabilities, uh, everything, uh, I think we talked about everything from uh, the uh, uh, the landing radar on the descent stage to the Kapton tape on yeah. the hatch. I mean, I don't think there was a single detail that went unnoted in that process. I think there were about six of us, and we all had questions. And every we stepped we stepped around the vehicle in quadrants, uh -huh. uh, the forward left side, commander side, and then each quadrant after that. And there was always something to find there to ask about and for uh, for Marty to uh, to talk about. And as you say, getting it from the, I don't like to say horse's mouth because people draw other allusions to that. Oh. But well, uh, uh, hearing, about, school, hearing, really, hear, hearing about that from the voice of experience, yeah, I'll yeah, say, from of... someone who's there and had his hands on that vehicle, yeah, that was a great day. And again, Marty, thank you very much for uh, bringing us along on that incredible journey. It was great. Well, you're welcome, Nixon. Thanks for the kind words, but uh, you added a lot to it also. You know, well, you... It, it was such a fun vehicle to learn about yeah. and to describe. And again, the, it was a, the eloquence of the simplicity of that spacecraft, all at the same time, simple yet complex. It was just such a testament to, uh, I'll say it, I'll, uh, America's ability to design something like this and do it in a relatively damn short period of time and have it be as successful as it was, not only as it was meant to be, but as it was not meant to be on the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, 
uh, it, just just a remarkable vehicle that you learn the history of it and you say, hell yeah, I, I trust my life to that vehicle. Absolutely. Well, it's yeah. beautiful to, to see it out there, the real deal. Uh, it's uh, blemishes and all. These aren't finely polished vehicles that go into space. You see the tape right there. You see the the things that they did. Uh, well, the odd, uh, 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 the odd unaerodynamic angles yeah I like yeah, to think yeah it's just it's just something else so uh but they yes yeah, so i've i've heard marty talk about that several times and i missed that afternoon uh but i uh, uh again uh, we'll do it again one day yeah out absolutely there. uh so we get the cm looking you got cm dave scott inside and the nose you can see you're looking head on into that docking probe with the uh, very real possibility yeah. he could return to space from space by himself if well, he can't uh, dock with these guys. Mike Collins on Apollo 11 talked about, in his book, Carrying the Fire, Mike talked about something called the Solo Book. And the Solo Book was a procedures book that you as a command module pilot had in the event that the other two guys were stranded on the moon and you had to come back home by yourself. Now, the Solo Book, <clears throat> just because of the nature of the Solo Book, it was not something you carried around with you when you're hanging out with the other two guys. Right, yeah. It wasn't something you talked about. Uh, in fact, you did your solo book sims while the other two guys were doing landing and EVA sims. So it was not something like, it wasn't a real subject of conversation. Uh -huh. And Mike Collins talks about, frankly, the sense of dread he felt whenever he handled that uh, that book it was something you knew you had to be prepared to do but it's something you, you just didn't want to do and in the back of your mind was how am i going to go down in history if this happens yeah you know, it wasn't it wasn't one of your vital concerns but in the back of your mind it was like you know i think even mike said i realize that if i have to use this i'm going to be a marked man for the rest of my life and you think about a possibility like that and it's You've got to button it up and say goodbye to those guys and do the TEI burn and come back home. I it's it's nothing anybody would relish. Absolutely, uh, but a necessary step of yeah of training. You, you can't be you, surprised about anything. That's right. Got to be ready for it, whether it's <clears throat> or not. Here's a picture through the rendezvous window of uh, of uh, of the CSM, that's and again, cool. edge on, you can see a good profile of that uh, uh, docking probe in the front of the command yeah. module. And the docking probe would be fully extended and would go into that drogue and three latches on the very tip of that probe would engage. And then once they were engaged, you retracted the probe, you pulled the two vehicles together, and then you ripple fired the 12 latches to hold the vehicle uh, tightly together. And the undocking procedure was just as complex because what you had to do was you had to release those 12 latches manually. And then when the time came, you extended the probe and s separated the two vehicles for a soft undock. Uh -huh. And once the two vehicles were stable, you would go ahead and release them and then perform the flyaway maneuver that was uh, performed by the uh, CSM. But you did that. You did that operation radially. In other words, with the long axis of the two spacecraft pointed toward the center of the moon or pointed toward the center of the Earth, because if you did it. Uh, 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 parallel rather than perpendicular, you could uh, uh, end up with a perturbation between the two vehicles with either a little bit of movement or a change in velocity of one or the other. So it was better to do it radially and uh, soft undock and then perform your uh, uh, your uh, uh, separation maneuver. Great explanation, Nick. But one of the classic photos of an astronaut in space come out of this program here. This yeah. From this one right here. There we go. Oh, oh, there's one ahead. There. No, this is the uh, rendezvous and docking of the uh, ascent stage with the uh, lunar module in Earth orbit. And uh, the the disadvantage of this particular maneuver on Apollo 9 was they performed it uh, with the sun in Jim McDivitt's eyes. And it was coming right through that rendezvous window. But um, mm. I think in this sense, it was Jim keeping his vehicle stable and Dave performing the actual uh, docking, but uh, that was one of the things we realized after this this particular mission. And we better pay attention to the beta angles during this uh, maneuver because they're going to be pretty critical. It's like landing a Cessna into the sun at twilight. Yeah, you, you, that runway's like, okay. Where is that damn yeah. center line? I got the sun in my eyes, but uh, yeah, yeah. Just again, one of the things you find out during a, a test flight. 
There's the picture I talked oh, about. Oh, yeah. Jim McDivitt. This is after the uh, limb has been uh, cast off and the guys are getting ready to come home. And, boy, this is just a great picture because, you know, here's Jim. He's the commander. Uh, the responsibility of safety and success of this mission has been on his shoulder for more than a couple of years. And here he is. We finally accomplished it. You know, we still got the reentry and the return to get to. But uh, I think the look on Jim's face is a combination of uh, um, fatigue and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I think satisfaction. Yeah. Job well done. You know, this is something you've worked toward and it's all come off uh, just the way you needed it to. You've made an important step of getting to the moon and God bless you, General McDivitt, for a fine job. Absolutely. We yeah. wouldn't say that back in the 60s, but today you'd say that expression is like, all the boxes are checked. Yeah. Everything's yeah. Uh, Everything went fine. And like I said, uh, uh, a it, lot it, of NASA it, managers called this the most <laughs> perfect mission ever flown of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. The feeling you have at this point, it comes straight from the uh, test pilot's lexicon. We're there. Yeah. Yeah. We're ready. We're ready to hand it off to you guys to go to the moon. You bet. This man certainly could have walked on the moon. Oh, he yeah. stepped down and become the manager of the whole Apollo, Apollo program. program. And again, the right man for the right job. He guided us through some really remarkable times, not the least of which was a recovery after Apollo 13. That's right. You know, there, was no. a, there was a lot to be unpacked after that <clears throat> flight. And General McDivitt was a large part of getting the, the program back on back on track. Happy landing in the ocean again there. Yeah, great splash down again. Uh, one of the few times, I think, where I don't see the uh, riding balloons inflated on the command module. These guys were lucky. They oh, had a steady state C, and they, they came up in the yeah, look how stable. Level the they came up there. in stable one. You know, they didn't get the, like Jack Lousman told me about on Skylab, coming home, and you get stable two where the apex of the nose is pointed down at the ocean, and your windows are covered with seawater. And Jack said one of the frogmen swam up to the window and gave him a thumbs up. And Jack didn't know he was upside down. So he thought, this was good or that was good. Yeah. Or, so he just gave him okay. <laughs> okay and they, the, they fired off the nitrogen uh, uh, bottle and filled up those uh, those that riding really balloons. Something. Yeah, Coming back from space, you're looking in the water. Somebody, oh, gosh. Uh, uh, and, you know, you've, you've already got the, the stomach awareness oh, of being geez. on the ocean yeah. and several days up on orbit. And, you're literally hanging from your straps and yeah. everything in the a lot of the stuff in the storage containers behind your couches have come loose and they're all falling toward the nose of the vehicle. So yeah. here's the nine crew on board the recovery vehicle, uh, the recovery carrier. And uh, back in those days, you remember that one of the things that we were used to was seeing the astronauts come home with heavy beards. And uh, we didn't really have onboard shaving until Apollo 10. Now on Apollo 8, Frank Borman was eh, did a little conscious about the condition of his beard, which on Gemini 7 when he came home was kind of stringy or a level head, one of these. Yeah, deep right. Growth. Yeah. And so <laughs> on the recovery carrier for eight, Frank had uh, an electric razor waiting for him. So he shaved off all the fuss. But here we have Jim McDivitt with that classic, uh, uh, I'll, I call it a seafarer's beard. And uh, it was it wasn't until Apollo 10 where we had the ability to go ahead and shave up on over it and come back uh, a little cleaner, a little nicer. But uh, again, here are three crew members after a job well done. Uh, not only history made, but engineering history made. Uh, I can't begin to count the number of firsts of this flight and technologies, certain technologies and techniques that a lot of people are saying, nah, we really can't do that. That's not going to work. Well, these guys were back and they proved that it could be done. And uh, they're, they are, I don't want to call them an unsung mission, but as far as the public is concerned, they look at Apollo 9 after Apollo 8 and say, what are we doing in Earth orbit again? We just went to the moon. Why can't we go to the moon and do this and so forth? But no, it's all part of that step-by-step -step progressing engineering philosophy mm -hmm. that brings you closer to your to your goal. Which uh, NASA stuck to. That yeah. was baby steps in Mercury and Gemini. Sure. Sure. And uh, the setbacks were, were weighed and, and going on there. Yeah. Uh, we got some people from our from the uh, task force group oh, of autograph yeah. seekers yeah. out yeah. there. You got you want to say hi to Bill Whiting's there on the yeah. bottom. Hello and Bill and hello to Tammy out there, members of our uh, 
Space Task Andy Group, Miller. as we, we say, the STG. And uh, a lot of friends out there today, uh, Dave Stangy, uh, Steve J, Christine. Uh, Christopher Mick. Christopher Mick, Mick I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, good. To, he's from Hudson, Wisconsin. Good to see you. Tom Usiak and, of course, Mark Usiak <clears throat> as well. Gary Gerald, Doug Forrest, uh, Cynthia Rossi, uh, CB, Carlton Bailey. He's out there. And uh, let's see, Tom, uh, uh, Tom Celentano, who's with us as well. Uh, the usual gang of friends and supporters. We are always glad to have you on board. Uh, and we we value your input, uh, the questions that you send in. And we value your support because it's your support that makes things like the <clears throat> American Space Museum possible. Uh, you get the word out there in several ways, and people come here to, to see the things that we have uh, uh, on exhibit. And you are just a very, very important part of our support group, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, had to have the boys here one last shot. Of course, oh, we lost yeah. uh, Jim McDivitt, the Irishman, yeah. lost him a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, both uh, Dave Scott, Scott is 91 years old, and Rusty Schweiker, I think, yep. is 88. Yep. And uh, yep. uh, they're still out there uh, championing uh, uh, the space program and inspiring youth and, and adults alike. Yeah, that's and, remarkable. Uh, you, which, you, which, see a, you see a picture like that, and you talk to the guys. What was it like getting together after all this time? It was like we... We're together just yesterday. Yeah. We just picked up from where we left off, yeah. and that's yeah. that's the that's the that's the team. That's the uh, that's the test flying uh, fraternity. Uh, I can't say fraternity now because we have female test pilots yeah. as well. well. The camaraderie. That's of, the camaraderie uh, of the test pilot community. I guess would be the best way to say it, because we've got some remarkable men and women out there getting this job done. And we got remarkable, remarkable men and women out there getting it done right now, uh, who don't have the publicity of say space bearers and things of that nature. But they're out there testing new aircraft such as the F thirty five and so forth, and uh, uh, getting the job done. So to the test flying community uh, of the uh, the uh, Navy and the Air Force, the Marines, and also the Army, to all the uh, members of the test flying community. We say thank you very much because you made more possible in our lives than we can possibly uh, adequately thank you for. Yeah, we're, yeah, exactly. Nick, we thank you. This is uh, spring break week yep. uh, out there. You're going to be quite busy out yep. there at the Kennedy Visitors yep. Complex. Yep. Uh, business is good, I know. Yep. And uh, uh, you just uh, at every 11 o'clock and 315 an astronaut of the day talks tells their story mm -hmm. takes questions yeah and then you go and do an autograph session who you have mm -hmm. out here this week mike baker uh is with us uh space shuttle veteran and twice a pilot a, twice a commander again one of the guys with a remarkable story because uh uh not only uh, does he have in a story he was he was eligible to do the carrier calls for the f-18 but he chose instead to go to the Empire Test Pilot School in England because he knew that would set him apart when it came time to be considered for the uh, for the astronaut corps. And then along with that, Bakes was very closely involved with the work with the Russians over the Shuttle Mir program what, and then what became the International Space Station program. Uh, and he, when you see his show, you talk to him, ask him about the the difference in approach between the Americans and the Russians. And he has such a unique perspective of that that you really should hear. It's a yeah, really remarkable he does. story. He's one of our favorites. He yeah. loves our museum and yeah. there. Uh, and a great guy. Uh, like I said, a great program in Delaware North does out there. Uh, Nick has been out there 37 years now. 38 years. 38 now. years. Don't I'm, sure cheat cheat some, out of that year there. Somebody asked me that, and I said, yeah, I've been out here for 38 years. And they pointed out to me that that was eight years longer than Johnny Carson hosted the Tonight Show. Oh, wow. So I was like, yeah, I'll take that. that. I'll take sure. that. And uh, if you're like a lot of us in the space business, uh, we feel like we, we, uh, uh, we're we cheating and getting paid for it. We're having right. so much fun. We like the money. Don't yeah, don't yeah. get you wrong Thank there. You but yeah. but uh, what, uh, what, a, what a time to be out there, Nick. Uh, yeah, oh, gosh. You're seeing it's... the best of the future and the past. Oh, gosh. And, you know, the upcoming Artemis program has really got me thrilled because it's Apollo all over again. I mean, the sense of adventure with the new vehicle, 
a great goal of going not only going to the moon but going four thousand miles beyond the moon and bringing that uh, crew of four back. I uh, I I just look back at it and I see you you know history is you know once it happens and it comes back again everything that was old is new again. I don't know how you want to put yeah. it, but there's that wonderful sense of adventure. But more importantly, there's a sense of anticipation on the part of the public, particularly these young people. You know, I'm lucky. I was growing up during the time we were regularly going to the moon. I could walk out in the backyard at night, look up at the moon and say to myself, my God, there are two Americans up there on the surface of that moon right now. The young people today are starting to anticipate that. And they're realizing that they are going to be let in for some memories and experiences that are really priceless in terms of a human lifetime. So I'm seeing that growing um, uh, excitement among the young people, and it's very gratifying to see. Well, we're looking forward to that. We want to get a new Boeing spacecraft up here in a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, we're going to have an eclipse of the sun that everyone's going yep. to be losing their minds about mm -hmm. here in a couple of weeks. So uh, we'll stay on top of all that, and we're glad that you're staying curious with this excellent space history like you get from nowhere else from the one and only mr nick thomas thank you thank you sir for another wonderful thank you day of sharing you some of me. your knowledge there marty thank you for a great job on Streamlabs. do we have anything to button up there you know did you want to read that note i gave you that um... yeah i mentioned it that uh, tom said that uh, 45 years ago columbia had arrived here at the space center so uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about Terry White about that yeah. in his April appearance here. Mikey Haddad is going to talk Wednesday about uh, a, a payloads uh, that he worked with. And we're going to have via space some young engineers in here on Future Friday on Stay Curious. So putting together our programs here as we're rolling into the uh, Shuttle Fest week uh, on April 13th. Nick's going to be our master of ceremonies and we've got a wonderful program of more than just astronomy missions some important shuttle missions that solve problems behind the scenes that had nothing to do with the, the astronomy payload so you're going to enjoy that at the hyatt place and we'll be talking about that for the rest of the week so until next time i'm mark marquette thanking nick thomas for staying curious with you today and saying i can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.